Hello, I'm Eugene. I'm Chris. And I'm Cynthia. And uh, Chris and I are the co-founders of a project called Courage to Look, uh, where we're um, studying as a group uh, the history of multicultural America. And um, we invited Cynthia to join us today. We just watched a news clip from a couple of nights ago. Um, maybe somebody can uh, synopsize what the clip was that we watched. Sure, I will. Um, the clip showed a story from a event that took place, I believe, in 1970 at Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, Jackson State University is a historically black institution. And uh, during a demonstration by um, over 400 young women and men you know, ended tragically when police officers, police officers showed up and shot you know, hundreds of rounds into buildings, killing two, two men and injuring 12, I believe. This incident went unaddressed by the Jackson city government and only recently over the past weekend were they allowed to walk and receive their diplomas. That was the subject of the video clip we watched. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so um, we had a brief discussion and we were articulating our reactions to that um, video. Uh, I'd like to just say that I've been processing this this information with disbelief, with uh, incredible um, um, empathy and sadness, as well as anger at, um, at where we are in history. Uh, I, I, and I was tinged with joy that 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 these uh professionals mostly professionals were able to finally receive the degree uh it, there's it, it was just such a loaded uh, uh piece of news reporting uh that i had been processing so many mixed emotions over the last few days yes i found the situation heartbreaking and unfortunate and you know uh ang anger angering um you know, to know that um, these um, young people with so much potential and uh, just wanting to have their voice heard and to feel like their presence was respected and invalidated to be met with such violence. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, this is very sad and um, unfortunately part of the Part of the way our country seems to work. The um, suppression of the information, apparent suppression, because, you know, back then I don't recall hearing about it and I have never heard about it and why it took so long to come up and for people to receive their um, diplomas at this point. Well, all I can say is, okay, well, it was the South. That's part of it. It's in the South. And I had a conversation with somebody today who is visiting the state of Texas and is across the street from homes with um, of Trump loyalists with signs talking about the um, uh, 2024 uh, running the possible um, candidacy uh, using the word revenge, uh, some kind of slogan, something of revenge. And, and I feel like oh, this is where we live now. This is today. This is, this is the climate. These folks who are um, regressive, in my mind, in their thinking, who hold a lot of um, absolute racist ideas, are living throughout the country, not just in the South. And, you know, had that college been in some state other than Jackson, Mississippi, um, had, had it been up north, uh, that incident clip that we saw, uh, it would have been addressed a long time ago, I think only because people tend to be a little bit more um, aware, not enlightened, <laughs> a little bit more aware living in, in other parts of the country or other states. So, I mean, I, I, I'm totally, dismayed every time I encounter this kind of information because it's just, I, 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 I feel very discouraged by um, how much 
how little progress has been made in people's thinking over the years. Yeah. And actions. I want to bring up a um, topic you used uh, uh, the um, um, story of uh, um, the front lawn signs saying revenge. And I think I think revenge is a is is a very powerful word. Revenge is taken uh, or initiated when something to that individual or group of individuals um, seems uh, or fe has felt uh, egregious enough. So m um, my question is, what's the difference between revenge? No matter what side of the political fence anybody is on, what's the difference for us as human beings between revenge and calling out the truth? I think initially revenge in and of itself doesn't have to be associated with the truth. Calling out the truth, okay, let's assume the truth really is the truth. Facts, F-A-C-T-S, facts, just the facts, ma'am. But revenge could, the foundation of revenge could be um, lies. And at least in the situation of our current climate in this country, uh, there are a lot of people telling lots of lies and perverting the truth. It, it, it's just absolutely shocking to me. Yes. I mean, as, a, as a student, as a student who protested, the, 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 I remember the state of mind of protesting and feeling really you know, fired up and angered at the wrongs of society and the Vietnam War and this, that, and the other thing. Um, and I haven't even felt a glimmer of that fervor in many years until these last four years, the kind of disgust and anger and also fervor. And, you know, I'd probably be marching if I, if I didn't have a condition that was too painful to walk more than two blocks. So, yeah. Uh, revenge is more for punishment or for um, it's an act of aggression. And I think um, calling out the truth is a way to re to resolve the, dis to the disagreement or to as a call to restore the relationship. Revenge seems like it's an irrational state of what is an irrational way of handling a, uh, a disagreement or a conflict. And unfortunately, it's just hard to reach people who are just so ingrained in lies and in mistruth. So let me let me further that question uh, a little deeper. Uh, by the way, the reference that Cynthia was making um, about uh, Just the Facts, ma'am, there was a TV show, I think, in the 70s called Adam 12, set in Los Angeles, where we're... we're uh, uh, Chris and I are uh, situated currently, uh, and the sergeant would say, Sergeant, what was this, Sergeant? Uh, the sergeant, who was one of the main characters, would just say, just the facts, ma'am, um, when he was investigating crime. I remember uh, it from Dragnet. Oh, it was Dragnet. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's see. see I, would, I came to that show when it was already already in in, in running in, in season. So... Um, what about the difference between um, meme blasting, uh, meme, um, the uh, social media um, use of the word, meme blasting and or meme grandstanding in calling out what you actually stand for? Grandstanding meaning you're putting on a false, a false affront? Both yeah, I, kind of. I mean, or any of the any mixture of the above, um, where where uh, we have sort of a you and I were talking about a month ago, uh, where I have had some frustrations with some personal friends on social media friends who are very fond of um, of meme blasting the current trends of the days, but their actual interactions with with me and. Uh, and um, their behavior uh, with uh, other of our friends is opposite of what they're actually um, meme blasting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They think they're calling out the truth, but it's coming from a different place. And I don't know how to respond to that. Yeah, responding to people on social media is such a loaded 
um, activity. Um, like you can, like, like in the case of your friends, Eugene, um, like you can be coming from a place of sincerity and a wish to have your voice heard and to hopefully inspire others to action. And some people either because it's the way communication happens on social media or because they're not willing to investigate their own insincerity. Um, it can be really, um, you know, painful as a friend to read statements and ha know that, or, you know, become aware of a bias or a uh, lack of integrity in such a, a clear and open way. I think that, that for me, um, sometimes I'll post a meme and other times I'll see a meme and I might want to respond. And then sometimes I say, why am I wasting my time on social media doing this? I could be doing, being engaged in more meaningful action that relates to even the subject matter of the meme. And sometimes I think people don't even think about the words in the meme, like they might instantly think it is a good thing, but if they thought about it more or actually engaged in a discussion with other people, they might realize that if you look behind the words, you could see another point of view that, that, that the meme is actually kind of an antithesis to what is what you think is being said here. So I don't know, I think a lot of times also memes, you know, you're reaching people that you presume to know, or you think you know, and you're kind of just preaching to the choir anyway. So in a way, I, I'm i beginning to feel that a lot of my own activity on social media is meaningless, you know, and, th and then people maybe don't even, often don't even show their true thoughts because what is people's attention span anyway? It's reduced to this meme. Do, do they have, you know, do they have enough attention to read three paragraphs? Maybe not. Do I really want to respond to this and say what I really think? Oh, what I saw this meme this other person responded to, and and they're a friend of mine too, but they're they believe in X Y Z. They're on the side of Israel, and this person's on the side of Palestine, and you know, like there's so much out there. It's just kind of a waste of time. I think that people need to be talking more in depth rather than even looking at memes. Talking is the precise point of uh, our Courage to Look project and, and the foundation upon which we, Chris and I, um, began talking about the, the possibility of doing this uh, work with um, primarily with other white people. Um, we don't know if we'll ever do this again, but uh the, the the last month was uh, a, a asian um, uh, american asian pacific, uh, and asian pacific islander history month and i uh, reposted a uh banner from representative ted Liu, who's down here in los angeles um eight out of ten Amer uh, asian americans report that they've been discriminated against and i got uh two shares of people i haven't heard from in a while uh and six likes and I just want to just share because we don't talk about these things um, for various reasons that that uh, our project gets into. It, it's only been once in my life, and it was actually earlier this year that somebody asked me, "Can you tell me about how you've been discriminated against?" Hmm. And I turned fifty-five in March, so I have essentially got not counting my toddler years. I've essentially gone about, you know, 54 years without ever being asked about um, how I was uh, treated as a as a, manifesting as as a predominantly Asian person. I'm sorry. I mean, it's such a to have something so you know closely tied to your identity and to have that. Um, be looked past that's that's difficult. But you know, to piggyback off what you said, I've had that same experience as well. Um I uh you know have had a number of uh of white friends over the course of my life. And it was only one time in college that someone actually asked me, well what like how do you experience being black? And I have um some friends that I knew from college that are, you know, they're you know progressive um, I have to say, but I guess when 
the topic of being a person of color related in a, on a personal level. I think that was something they either didn't know how to begin to talk about, or they they didn't necessarily think to, to ask. I mean, there, there were men, so in, in men generally, we don't talk about, um, you know, personal, uh, our personal feelings in that way, but, um, but yeah, I, I definitely uh, sympathize. I just wonder whether, Eugene, you thought over the years, it, the fact that people didn't ask that specific type of question of you meant that they were oblivious to it or, or maybe they felt that in themselves that they kind of knew anyway because of their awareness of racial discrimination or discrimination against whomever. I mean, so I, I'm, I sort of remember talking with, um, I, I had a relationship with a Japanese man, lived with him for, I don't know, close to three years. And he was interred um, during the World, World War, War II, he and his family. And I remember asking him about it. I don't remember if I asked him how he felt. I mean, I never felt that he had a great deal of anger, but but um, this was around the time, I think, when reparations were being talked about for the Japanese people, I think of about $20,000 each. And I can remember talking a little bit about that with him. And, and But beyond that, I, I don't remember exactly anything he said, you know, but I've never, um, I mean, I, I, and now I realize I don't really know, but I think I've always felt like I know that people have been discriminated against. I know the hatred. I, I've seen it in my own family growing up. I've seen it in people that I went to school with. Um, I've experienced um, fear in myself in certain situations uh, where people of color were um, involved. But, but I've never actually thought, like to ask the question, how did you experience it or what was your feeling about it? I guess my own hesitancy would be if I were speaking to either of you would be, would you feel um, upset or affronted by the question and to hear that maybe you're disappointed that more white people haven't asked that kind of question kind of surprises me in a way I you know or white people that know you well it kind of surprises me that to hear that sort of catching me on the spot like that surprises me uh, today, uh, today is May 18th, and uh, the, later on today, I saw in the news that the House of Representatives is going to pass an anti-Asian um, hate uh, bill, and hopefully that will go somewhere. It actually came from the Senate. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that legislating love <laughs> and compassion is necessarily the best way to go, but what, this the, the difficulty that we just experienced, sort of the awkwardness of this topic just now kind of displays that that it, it is needed that we just try we need to try to talk to each other um and it's going to be awkward and it's going to be like a, a five-year-olds driving a car uh, but we have to be learn to be comfortable with that uh yesterday i think I, it was yesterday or two days ago chris and i watched about a a, a, a two or three minute uh clip uh, of a movie uh, um and uh, had to do with uh, um, uh, topics that are intersectional um, among various different um, cultures and races. Uh, and I noticed myself, I wanted his feedback on, on the, this uh, movie clip uh, that was queued up. And I, know, I, and I noticed a little bit of a hesitation and then it just pushed right forward. I just, I, I was like, literally like stumbling. I went, how did that make you feel? <laughs> and then it just, and then we were able to actually, you know, um, take it forward from there and create something with it uh, and envision uh, all kinds of different um, 
methods to, to get us used to being five-year-olds driving that car. Yeah, I, I, you know, your metaphor of a five-year-old driving a car is, is I, I think, an apt one. I think, you know, people like us who are committed to investigating ourselves and trying to, uh, you know, ensure quality in the ways that we can moving through our lives, I think we, uh, there's some, you know, I think our intentions are, are good, but sometimes just because of either how we've experienced topics conversations on, on race in the past, or because, you know, to a degree, you know, speaking for myself, you know, opening up about aspects of my race can be, you know, difficult because there are a lot of emotions, you know, next to that. But I think the more we try to have these, conver these conversations, even if they're awkward, the better we can get at having them and being a bit more nuanced and and clear, I think, you know, all the better. I just kind of marvel at some things from my past where um, I had very close relationships with people who didn't open up about their experience of being a person of color. And was that, I mean, I now I look back and I think, well, is that because I didn't ask? I mean, there was certainly very fond feeling and love between myself and the other people. Was it because I didn't ask the right questions? I mean, isn't, you know, what, or was it felt that it was unnecessary? So like, like that it wasn't necessary because the relationship felt safe. So there wasn't any need to discuss it. Or was that just a factor of the times? Like now these days, this topic is being talked about more openly among certain people. You know, and I don't really know. I can only deal with, um, you know, the people that are in my life now, and neither of those people are in my life anymore. And, um, uh, you know, like, I don't even know where one of them is. And, uh, and the other one's still a friend, but not someone I see a lot. So, you know, um, but I, I have to say that um, I've known Eugene for what, three years now, maybe? And we've had a few conversations sort of dancing around and some of it's been Please. uncomfortable for me. And, um, and I've not known necessarily what to say or how to say things um, or whether I should even consider asking. And, you know, so yeah, it's uncomfortable. So let's um, uh, end on a, a, a little bit of a helpful note, uh, which is if you were to put into a pithy statement, I mean, a pith statement, how we can help one another, the three of us, if we were ever to do this again, um, although we'll have other guests in the future, uh, our, our Courage to Look group and our, our immediate um, um, society, it is obvious the is it is obvious unless we talk no matter what is the color of our skin unless we talk about racism um it is never going to be addressed and just because it doesn't affect me personally um x amount of times uh it is all of our uh responsibility so to have this conversation uh what does it take to, to be be able to maybe be more of a 15 and a half year old driving that car rather than a five year old. Um, or what's a, a pithy advice or statement that everybody would maybe bring to the table and we'll continue to add to this as, as time goes on. Um, maybe Chris, you can start. I guess in a sense, you have to be comfortable being wrong in a sense, like you, like for instance, you know, the conversation that Eugene and I had about this video clip, I'm, you know, um, Eugene may have been trying to couch his answers as not to offend me, but I think, you know, that he recognized that and tried to be as, be both direct, but also um, to, to be direct without being blunt. I think I was able to recognize his honesty and respond in kind. So I think just being willing to be open and honest with people in an authentic way, I think that does open up the open up the possibility for open and uh, fulfilling conversation yeah it, it, 
I have no idea, you know, because you don't really know whether the person you're talking to, um, if it's a person of color and you're white, whether they want to talk about it with you. At what point in your relationship do you steer a conversation in that direction? You know, how do you raise it? Is it like something that, oh gosh, I saw that thing on the news last night about such and such. Maybe that, that you know, that could open a conversation and that might be one way to do it. And I would say just to top things off uh, is to look for the societal intersectionality stories like this uh, news story that we started today's conversation with about um, something that happened in, in one social setting in university that also happened in another that happened to be in the South and in a predominantly black university. And to, just to see how far conversations could get. And it doesn't need to be um, uh, in mixed company. It could be white people talking about um, that with each other. And I think that's very helpful. So thank you um, for joining us, Cynthia. Um, this is the Courage to Look project, and uh, please like and subscribe and um, share these videos, uh, and we hope to um, uh, bring another conversation to uh, our YouTube channel very, very soon. Thank you.